question. So um, just, just by way of introducing you, Carlisle, to, um, to the audience, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the fact that when you, um, when you started out in life as a young man with ambitions, you actually wanted to be a painter, didn't you? I, uh, yes, when I was very young, I wanted to be a painter, uh, simply because one of the first things I did in the artistic realm well, the very first was to draw, and which I started doing when I was about four or five there. And I also wanted to play the piano, and my mother being a pianist, I imposed on her to teach me piano, and she got all the requisite piano instruction manuals and, and started me, and as soon as I realized there was work involved, that was the end of that. <laughs> Uh, I subsequently took up piano seriously when I was 10 years old, but there was a hiatus there of about seven years. Um, so right from the beginning, um, I was interested in, 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 uh, uh, in drawing and continued to draw through high school. And then once I began becoming serious as a, as a solo pianist uh, and approaching that career, uh, I gave up drawing and never have really gotten back to it, but uh, I keep thinking in my old age, if you can believe what that may be, uh, I would get back to it again, to do some sketching. Um, you, you talked there about your, um, your studies of piano, which um, followed on from that original um, aspiration, perhaps to be a visual artist, and I was wondering whether you could say something about your childhood in terms of the music that you grew up with, because your father, was a Methodist minister, and you grew up going to uh, meetings of, uh, of uh, preachers, and, uh, and there would have been a strong kind of musical element in those revival meetings, wouldn't there? Uh, very definitely. There were certainly uh, hymns which were known specifically as revival hymns, uh, certainly something that I think Tony would have found familiar as well. Um, and of course, uh, um, Growing up in the small towns in the South, uh, cultural life was, was pretty scarce to begin with. And uh, really, uh, so much of the music one heard was of a church variety. I mean, whether they be hymns or anthems or whatever. Um, but uh, that, plus the fact that my mother being a pianist, I heard a great deal of what were called semi-classics at the time, that kind of thing. So, or, um, just kind of salon um, piano pieces. So it wasn't a life completely bereft of, of music. It just was a special kind of music. But certainly I heard a great deal of music for the church, for the Protestant church too. And in fact, that's, that's been a sort of theme throughout a lot of your work as an opera composer, hasn't it? I mean, your most well-known and most performed opera, Susanna, is on a biblical theme. Could yeah. you tell us a little bit about that? Um, well, Susanna is simply an updating of the uh, apocryphal book of Susanna. Uh, and in my version, uh, she is transferred to the uh, Tennessee mountains. Uh, she's a very uh, young, spirited young lady, um, 18 years old, who is uh, erroneously convicted of being an evil and immoral girl because of being found bathing in the nude. Uh, when the elders for the church are looking for a baptism creek. And the whole idea being because of the lust that le uh, the, uh, the elders feel towards Susanna, they then brand her as being the evil one. So it's a story of, of false condemnation and um, also uh, something that was very current in the period because this was written during the McCarthy era in America. Uh, <laughs> Uh, accusation being tantamount to guilt. Mm. Proof was not important, but... So, so did you write the opera in some sense as a kind of attack on McCarthyism? Um, not consciously. I think unconsciously I did because it was a very dark era in our history. Uh, and I was a very young professor at a state university in which we had to, we had to sign uh, affidavits saying that we had never belonged to the Communist Party. Uh, and of course, none of us had ever had any idea of doing that. But just the just the fact that we had to do it made it all pretty onerous, mm. and something that uh, 
uh, certainly gave you one uh, one indication of of the temper of the times. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if you kept if you kept your job, you signed. If you didn't keep your job, I mean, if you didn't sign, you didn't keep your job, uh, which is its own kind of fascism. Mm. Um, so I lived through that period and seen people uh, being accused of things that they had absolutely no idea of. And uh, it was a very, very black period in, in our history. And so I think subconsciously uh, that was all stored so that to, when I began Susanna, I felt very, very passionate about these various themes that I did tackle in the in the opera, such as, as I said, uh, just uh, accusation being tantamount to guilt being certainly one of the most the chief chief one. Mm -hmm. um, but it was enough to uh, to launch my career as a as a composer of operas and. Uh, at a time in America when there were very few opera companies. Uh, when I began my career in the early 1950s, uh, there were only three major companies that could have launched me as a composer, and that was the Metropolitan, which was an entirely European company, uh, or the San Francisco, which was also European, and uh, then the New York City Opera Company, which was a, a, an American company doing American works as well as of standard works. And of course, that was my venue, was the, the now very much uh, uh, un, under a great deal of pressure mm. to, to remain solvent of the city opera. But um, uh, it, it was a time, uh, um, as I said, uh, the, the, uh, certainly the MacArthur era, when I began, because we're speaking now of 1955-56, we're, it was still very fresh in our minds and in our in our in our brains and in our personalities. Um, now, when you decided to adapt um, *Of Mice and Men* in 1970, this was not your first attempt at literary adaptation. You had, in fact, done an adaptation of *Wuthering Heights*, mm -hmm. which you have described as a fiasco. So what, what went wrong with Wuthering Heights? Yes, you have. I, li I listened to you on public radio describing it as a fiasco. Are you sure it wasn't my second opera, Fugitives? No. But tell us about the literary adaptation of Wuthering Heights. <laughs> no, the reason I'm so startled is because I consider Wuthering Heights one of my best operas. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my second opera was an opera that I did to a, uh, um, a libretto of my own, uh, which, to, um, to put it kindly, was absolutely a fiasco. <laughs> and w it was withdrawn immediately and has never been seen or heard of since. It now resides in the Library of Congress for anybody who's really interested. But I hope nobody is, because <laughs> it's very bad. But uh, that was the opera that, from which I learned the most because the next opera I did was Susanna. Mm -hmm. But my second opera was Wuthering Heights, which was commissioned by the Santa Fe Opera, which was just in its second year of existence mm -hmm. then. And um, uh, one of the reasons that I did it was to, uh, because everybody had this, you know, in, in our business and in most artistic businesses, you get labeled very easy. And I had been labeled as a result of Susanna because Susanna contains hymns, it contains folk, mm. folk light music, not actual folk music, but uh, as a composer of Americana, which I wanted to avoid very much. So um, my publishers, uh, decided that it should be Wuthering Heights, which I protested vehemently at the beginning because I thought this is just really, it's one of our great classics and I didn't know that I was up to it. But uh, nevertheless, when the commission came through, it specified that it was to be Wuthering Heights. And it's the only time in my entire career that I've had a, a subject matter which was specified for me in the con commitment mm. because otherwise I'd make my own choice. But, uh, and uh, in retrospect, of course, I'm very, very glad I did it because it's one of my favorite operas now of mine. So but I can't verify it as a fiasco, unfortunately. I'll have to go back and look through my notes again. But um, I guess the, the benefit of, uh, of the Bronte text is that you didn't have to deal with the estate. In the case of Steinbeck, um, Steinbeck, mm -hmm. you were actually in correspondence with him for some time through your agents, as far as I understand, but you never met, did you? We never met. I mean, I, I assumed that we would meet, and I assumed that he assumed that we would meet, 
Uh, but he died suddenly of a heart attack in 1968, two years before My Shimon had its premiere. Uh, we, you were, but you're correct. Uh, my publishers worked through his agents and then his message would come to me that way and also my reaction back to him. Uh, and it was a very, very um, easy and comfortable working relationship. He, um, he never had anything to, to criticize remarkably about my libretto uh, except one thing which I think is very, very important and I was just discussing it in a previous interview I did. He wanted no reference to the 1930s, mm. yeah, which I, I thought really was very, very interesting. Yeah. Um, and also told me that, uh, I, he didn't tell me, but I just inferred from this, that uh, what he felt was important in the book was not anything having to do with social issues and, uh, and economic uh, uh, depravities of the time. But uh, he, uh, what I uh, believe he intended was, was the concentration on the, the very simple theme of uh, the, the fact that a, a, a flawed relationship, very incomplete relationship, such as it exists between George and Lenny, uh, is preferable to the absolute solitary isolation of the ranch hands. Mm. And I think that's what he had in mind, and it was a marvelous way to dramatize that theme. And I came to know his widow, Elaine Steinbeck, very well, and uh, she paid me the uh, highest compliment of all. He, she said, your of my sin men is what John, Beck, what John thought was important in the novel. Mm. So uh, for whatever that's worth, uh, I hope that's not the case. Now, am I right in thinking, I have, to, I have to check this with you first, that there was a revision to the original version that you did because when you <laughs> first wrote the opera, it was getting too long and you decided you had to cut some things. You have read all of my, <laughs> I'm very impressed, very good. <laughs> uh, that's quite true. I made a fatal mistake. Uh, as most of us know, the Of Mice and Men is a very slender novella of about 120 pages. And I think that uh, I was seduced into thinking that, that Mr. Steinbeck had done my work for me. And so the, really all I did was to dramatize, dramatize the book, uh, which, was, which he had already done as a play, which was quite successful in New York. And I was not aware of this, however, until I had finished all of the libretto uh, this very misguided libretto, my first one, and also about two thirds of the music, and it was getting to be the length of the Get a Rot or something, <laughs> something of Wagnerian length. And so I thought this spare novel, this is the one thing I wanted to, to perpetuate in the uh, operatic version, the leanness of, of the, the Steinbeck novella. And I, obviously, I, once, I, once it had gotten to this very inflated proportions, I was certainly not following that. Mm. So I realized that something was desperately wrong, which as it happened, turned out to be the uh, libretto, which it usually is with most unsuccessful operas. Not always, but very frequently. Uh, and so I simply went back, started all over again, and never again referred to the book, never, uh, never looked at it again. But, uh, did what I think was my own of Mice and Men at the urging of some stage director friends of mine that I trusted very much. Uh, and I think that was my salvation. I simply started over and said, what is this story about? And once I came up with the, what the through line of the story was, and it's basically a suspense story. It all comes down to one very simple statement. How long can George, keep Lenny out of trouble mm. so that they can uh, acquire this very modest home they, they're looking for and also then have the dream that, they are, uh, that dominates their lives of a place of their own. And it's as simple as that. It's under 25 words. But that gave me my lead in and then everything that didn't feed directly into that, that through line, I simply eliminated. And so that's the way the, uh, the present uh, libretto stands. And then once I was on that footing, it went very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I, I felt that this is what I want to do with the, with the piece from the very beginning. 
I just wanted to come back to you, Carlisle, and ask you about whether um, movies were very influential in your work as a composer and librettist, because I, I read an interview, and again, I need to check with you that this is right, um, in which you said that you wanted to make sure that the opera moved along at a real clip and that there were sort of no dead moments and that you wanted it to have the pace of a film. So were you quite influenced by the sort of cinematic language while you were working as a composer? Well, I think I was influenced by cinematic language growing up. I think almost everybody in America, and probably Australia at the same time, in the in the 30s and the 40s, uh, films were our art form. I mean, uh, and if if uh, if you saw uh, serious music being represented, it was usually represented in a film of some kind. Mm -hmm. I mean, although you you, uh, you may have had the good fortune to hear a pianist in person, but you were more likely to have seen that pianist or a, a pianist in a film. But uh, so I grew up very, very much in the film tradition, and I, I consider that that was a very part of, very much a part of my um, whole adaptation towards uh, writing for the stage. But were you ever? I, I, I'm not aware of whether you've written any scores for movies, have you? No, I've never have. But, Would you uh, like to have done that? I always wanted to try that. Yes, I think it's a different, different um, discipline. I'm quite aware of that, but I would like to see what, whether I can master it or not. Oh, well, why not try now? <laughs> <laughs> um, I also wanted to ask you, just, just to finish up, about the fact that you've obviously seen, I think, 20 productions of, of Mice and Men, and, um, or, or more. Maybe mm -hmm. you've seen more than 20, but the other night you were saying to me that in one particular production, we've had, we've had ongoing problems with the dog in the cast. The, the dog, uh, well, you'll see, but anyway. And, and the other day, um, Carlisle said that in one particular production, the dog just plain walked off the stage in the middle of the scene, didn't come back, and, and, and a singer had to go off stage, pick him up, <laughs> carry him back on. So have you seen anything particularly unusual or remarkable in terms of the numbers of productions of your opera that you've seen where you've kind of raised an eyebrow and thought, hmm, not too sure about that? Uh, no, I, I can't really say that I have. Um, now, um, I, I was saying earlier to Andrea, I mean, uh, I've seen two productions of, of Mice and Men in Europe, uh, the most recent being in, in 01 in the Bregenz Festival mm -hmm. with a beautiful production by Francesca Zambello, uh, which was subsequently done in Washington and in Houston, um, as well as the Bregenz Festival. That it was it was different, but it was the same. And uh, she frequently, as a director, can um, go into rather extreme uh, directorial uh, uh, alleys that, that I don't necessarily follow on. However, in the case of Mice and Men, it was very very true. I th thought to the to the novel and also to the opera, and it was a very successful production. Um, I saw a production in in France of, of Mice and Men, and I was afraid it was going to be, uh, you know, what is commonly called these days Euro trash, uh, uh, <laughs> which I don't mean in a derogatory sense, but perhaps I do. <laughs> <laughs> At least when I think of some think some operas of mine in in Europe that I've that I hardly recognized, uh, th then I suppose that applies, but. Uh, I think this, this. I think any good director, if they get hold of the uh, uh, of the opera, and if they read the libretto, I, I think the, uh, there's a simplicity and a spareness and a uh, um, uh, about it. I don't think they can go too far wrong if they observe basically what's what's in the libretto, or and also but more importantly, what's indicated by the music. Mm. Um, uh, because I, I think it's all there. I hope it is. And I, th I think then that to take the story beyond it, its limits mm -hmm. would, would be, in, uh, I think it would be dangerous territory for a director. So I've been very fortunate in that. Uh, I can't say the same, same for my opera of Susanna. I've seen some absolute travesties of that, but uh, um, mostly in Europe, I will have to say. But, uh, <laughs> and, 
with the so-called director's theater that is now very much the fashion in, in Europe, especially in Germany, in which the uh, directors use the opera as the, the point of departure. <laughs> uh, and I can't say that ever makes me very happy. I saw a production of Susanna, as a matter of fact, in which in the, on the, in the opening scene of the second act, in which Susanna and her brother Sam are discussing whether she will go to a revival meeting or not, on stage wandered a character dressed as Elvis Presley. <laughs> <laughs> and my first reaction was, oh my God, this, this guy has come to the wrong theater. <laughs> Except he, he had a bit, can of beer, swilling it, and he sat down on the front porch in a rocker while this, the dialogue went on. You understand, he was completely unacknowledged by Sam or Susanna. <laughs> he was just there. <laughs> and, and so at the end of the scene, he walks off with Sam, and there's never any explanation <laughs> of what he's doing on the porch in East Tennessee. I mean, it's a... Uh, I subsequently spent an evening with the cast trying to find out, I was playing, what did this mean? What did that mean? And they would explain to me. Uh, and that was supposed to be a comment on American pop culture of the 1950s. And of course, my obvious question was, how does the audience know that? <laughs> because my publishers were there and I remember a phone conversation after I got back to my hotel we went through various things that we didn't know what they meant. And I said, what about Elvis Car Presley? What was he doing in there? And she says, I have not the slightest idea. And so that's as close as we got to it. That kind of thing I think is needless and is also, I think, damaging mm. to a work. Mm. I can't think of anything, any production of Mice and Men that has suffered the same fate, thank, thank goodness. goodness for that. And I'm very grateful for that. And certainly Bruce is, is wonderfully faithful. Mr. Floyd, you said earlier that um, you were aware of the, uh, the loneliness of the ranch hands and as we've seen the other characters in this production. Uh, just, do you feel that uh, you've been able to convey that, especially in this production, as well as, the, as a subtext to the, 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 the George and Lenny? I think it's... I think it's pretty evident that these are men whose lives are constantly on the move. They, we were talking about bedrolls a while ago. I mean, that's their way of moving from one place of labor to the next. Uh, and they have everything they own usually rolled up into bedrolls. Uh, but uh, while I don't specifically single out their loneliness, I think it's very evident at the end of Act One when they all sing moving on. Uh, and each man really into himself, uh, uh, talking about the loneliness of their life, and um, th this is their, basically without saying so, this is their fate as human beings to live lives of no connections in, in uh, either human or in terms of where they live. But uh, it's all a question of moving on, which it becomes, um, uh, also, as, as um, Andrea should, might have pointed out to you, uh, is it becomes a theme for, for much of the music you hear after this, after it's first announced at the end of Act One. Uh, you hear variations on this theme of, of um, moving on mm -hmm. throughout the uh, rest of the opera. Uh, but I hope it's, it's implicit, I hope it's explicit too. Question, but what makes a bad opera or a good opera? <laughs> In 25 words or less. Huh? <laughs> uh, I think, and uh, I've talked this over with colleagues of mine, to me, uh, a good, a successful opera uh, is at least dependent 60% on the libretto and possibly even more. I think there are more operas in the operatic graveyard that died because of a very poor libretto, because composers are not necessarily the best choosers of material. 
um, and they may write quite professional scores that has a lot of, have a lot of merit, but I think the thing that, that, that absolutely guarantees or condemns an opera to extinction are poor librettos. Uh, and you say, well, what is, makes a poor libretto? Uh, a libretto that doesn't basically honor, t the two basic ingredients for opera is uh, passion or very intense emotion and also action. Uh, the one thing that you avoid, like the plague, I mean, if you want to uh, create a successful opera, is any kind of just intellectual uh, discussion. Uh, <laughs> but, but you, because it's, first of all, it's song. So you have the elongation of words through music, and uh, there, is, there is certainly no emotion or action, either one, impl implied in, a, in an intellectual discussion unless it, it is part of something else again. Uh, so I think that I've, what I always look for in a libretto, and I'm constantly, I'm, as a matter of fact, right now, I'm, I'm considering two libretto projects, both of which have these elements. The first thing I look for is a crisis situation. Opera is not just any day. It's the exact day. I mean, look at the end of the first act of Tosca. That collision of Tosca and Scarpia there. That's not just any day. It's the day he came and uh, looking for her. Uh, and this could go on ad infinitum in, in a role that, uh, that uh, Tony is very famous for now, Peter Grimes. Um, the, the entrance of Grimes into the, uh, into the hut during the storm. That's not just any night. It's the night of the storm. So it has, in other words, it has the very highly dramatic natural elements that feed into it. Uh, and I've often said, using that as an example, just imagine his appearing in the door without the storm behind him. And you lose, I would say, what, 50% of the dramatic effect. So it, it's, it, these are just some of the things that one has to consider. It's, it's a very, very severe discipline, I, I find doing a correct libretto. I mean, not correct, but one that, that it's going to work. And I think that's the first and, and certainly the biggest major hurdle that a composer is confronted with in writing an opera. But uh, I really meant that, and uh, something that, that Caroline said earlier, I was once doing a, uh, um, an interview for the New York Times, and I simply said, in connection with this. I don't want a, the audience to ever have a chance to blink. <laughs> this comes, I think, from my going to the movies. <laughs> and I said, I think the modern audience expects to, to, uh, to nod off during an opera. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I remember when my opera, Willie Stark, was done at the Kennedy Center and I was sitting next to the, the head of the Congressional Committee on the Arts, who was a very, very, uh, wonderful gentleman from Illinois, and he paid me the uh, supreme compliment afterwards. He said, Mr. Floyd, I, went, I flew out to Illinois today to see my constituents and flew back tonight, and I thought, well, I'm going to the opera. Oh, great. I'll have a chance to doze. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, I have to tell you, I never dozed once during the entire <laughs> opera. I consider that the ultimate compliment. So, 